Two weeks ago, we were studying the book of Acts, and we saw Apostle Peter preach this powerful and convicting sermon, right? And in one day, the church grew from 100 people to 3,000 people. Lots of people became Christians that day. And for those who were converted that day, it was a momentous day because from that moment on, they did not just receive a citizenship, a permanent citizenship in heaven. They also receive a new mission in life. That is to bring heaven down to earth by practicing the ways of Jesus. This is also the meaning of our life as well, even in the 21st centuries for anyone who wishes to follow Jesus today. Now, as a result of this, this big revival, big conversion, a brand new church community was formed immediately afterwards that gave us a glimpse of what heaven must look like. And back in the first century, this early church community was so irresistible that it kept growing after, after that initial big launch day. It kept growing exponentially week after week until about 100 years later, they essentially took over the Roman Empire. I remember a few months ago when we were interviewing Christina for her position, I asked her a very important question in our first interview. I asked her, what should a healthy church community look like? What should a healthy church community look like? How would you respond to that question? You guys know her answer? She said, Acts chapter 2, verse, 47 to 40, verse 42 to 47, which is the message that, the passage that we're going to look at this morning. So, open your Bible. We're going to be in that last paragraph in the book of Acts, and we will read it a few verses at a time. But let's bow our heads, and let's ask the Lord to help us first. Heavenly Father, as we come to this passage, show us a glimpse of heaven that moves our hearts and, 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 and draw our attention because we want our church, we want all the churches in Toronto and around the world to look like this as a witness, Lord. And through this passage, what we know not, teach us. What we have not, give us. What we are not, make us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Isaiah. Verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. The apostles' teaching here is like the preaching from figures like Apostle Peter, James, and John, and later on the Apostle Paul. However, their preaching is, is different. It's different from the one that you typically hear today. And the difference doesn't lie in the content or in the passion or in the way they deliver the sermon. The difference is this. The Holy Spirit is intended to write the Bible through these apostles. So the words that they spoke wasn't just personal opinions. They carry the direct authority of God. In contrast to this, when you listen to a 21st century sermon like the one you know, you're hearing this morning, my words only hold weight if they align with the Bible. My words only carry authority if they are from the Bible. But it's different in the community that we're looking at today because back then the New Testament wasn't written yet. And when the apostles preached, their words carry the, the authority and the power of God. And that's why here when it says the apostles teaching, what that really means is a devotion to the Bible when we want to apply it to our modern day. Now beyond biblical teaching, the early church also dedicated a lot of time to the breaking of bread. Right? As you can see here, this doesn't mean they were just having food. They did have that, as you see later on in the passage. They did have a lot of food together, but this breaking of bread specifically meant the communion. This is a ritual that Jesus established at the Last Supper before he went to the cross. And he wanted his followers to do this regularly in remembrance for his death. And we as a church are going to partake that this morning. So as you can see here, this is the communion. Moreover, they also devoted lots of time to prayer. And this is important because prayer is the highest privilege and also the most essential responsibility of the Christians in the church. Christians have to regularly talk to God about what's going on in our life and also to seek His will, not just in our life, but also in our society as well, right? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, not just for you, not just for me, but for the entire society, the entire city. So the early Christians devoted themselves to biblical teaching, communion, and prayer because the worship of God is the most important function in the church community. 
The worship of God is the most important function in the church community. Passionate devotion, heartfelt devotion to God that consumes you, your mind, your spirits, your souls, your emotion. The, that passionate worship is what makes a church community irresistible. It's the most important. It's the number one thing when it comes to making a church community irresistible. Because the moment a church loses its devotion to worship, it also stops being a church. You can lose a lot of things in a church. You can have a not so good kids ministry. You can have a not so you can have a not so good outreach program. You can have a not so good small group. But if a church loses its devotion to worship, its commitment to the sacraments of God, the preaching of the word, the prayer, the singing, the praise, if the church loses that passionate worship, it stops being a church. And every ministry of our church flows from that passionate act of worship. Let's continue. Verse 43, And all, as they did this, all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Signs and wonders were done through the apostles, as you can see here, which meant there were a lot of miracles happening. But you have to remember, though, these miracles were not random magic trick meant to impress people. Okay, like the apostles didn't say, Jackson, fly, and then Justin just, Jackson just starts flying. That's not the kind of miracles they were doing. The miracles that Jesus performed and later on the apostles performed in the New Testament were restorative in nature. They were here to heal the brokenness of the world caused by the sinfulness of all of humanity. They were all about helping those in need. So the miracles that were happening is like when the apostles would go on the streets or in their church community, they would see a need, they would start praying for people, and as they pray, the blind would begin to see. The cripples would get up and walk. You're going to see this in the next passage, right, in a, in a, in, in a few weeks. And people who were trapped by demonic spirits were then set free as the apostles prayed for them. Signs and wonders were done to them. In addition to that, Christians also began pulling their resources together and then redistributing their possessions so that everyone can eat, including the, least, the most vulnerable, including the poorest among them. So that the wandering children who lost their parents can have a place to sleep at night. So that the lonely widows can experience love. Do you see what they were doing here? They were serving the cities, right? Through the signs and wonders, through the miracles, and through the redistribution of their possessions, they were serving the city. They look around at their neighbors, and they try to serve them, especially the least, the, the, the least among them. And their mindset is, if money can solve a problem, then we're going to fundraise, and we will give. But if it's something that money cannot fix, then we will pray for them fervently. And as they did that, God did all kinds of miracles through them as a result. I think this teaches us that if you are a follower of Christ today and Jesus is as important to you as you say he is, then how you spend your money should make your non-Christian friends scratch your head because you are so generous. You give so much away out of joy to help those who are in need. Now, there's nothing wrong with a Christian making lots of money. You guys have heard me say this a lot of times. In fact, I believe if you follow the biblical principles amount of money that's laid down by God, then you're going to do just fine. You're going to do just fine, and you will have plenty enough for you and your family. But the thing is, once you reach that stage where your family is safe and they're well-fed, what's next? What are you doing with your money beyond that point? And I really believe that it is inconsistent with our faith if most of our money at that point goes to personal comfort, like vacations, new cars, bigger houses, nice clothes, while our neighbors don't have enough to live on, while the people in our city don't have enough to live on. That is not, that is not to say you can't do any of these things. But when your family is safe and well-fed, where does the most of your, family, of your money go to? Does any of them go to serve the city? And this, this, this is not just about the money, right? As you can see with the apostles, they were also praying a lot for them, reminding us that whether you have money or not, it is our duty 
to pray for the sick, the vulnerable, the hurting in our community. And shameless plug here, you guys are gonna do just that when you attend and reach the 3 k.m. class starting in two weeks, because that's what we're gonna do. We walk into the neighborhoods surrounding this church building and we ask God to open our eyes to the needs of the community and see what is the best way we can serve as God's hand and feet. I think that's what will make us irresistible. Verse 46. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they receive their food with glad and generous heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. The early Christians really enjoyed their time together, as you can see. They went to the temple together, which is the place for worship, the house of worship, right? And then afterwards, they went home to share a meal together. They enjoyed each other's company because they were building community. They were building community and asked the early church, worship God, serve the city, and then build the community. The Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. Serve, worshiping God, building community, and serving a city, that is what made the early church so irresistible. It's the combination of all three together. It's a combination of all three together. And this is important for us because sometimes churches have the tendency to prioritize one or two of those and devaluing at the cost of the third one. For example, like, um, for, for example maybe a church is really big on Bible study, really big on passionate worship, but then we are not going out into our neighborhoods to serve those who are in need. Or maybe a church is a big community. Everyone loves being with each other. And we are a church of social justice, activism, and mercy ministry. And we are being God's hand and feet in our community, serving the poor, helping the homeless, doing all of these things. But we devalue the word of God because we think it is offensive. We think it doesn't matter. We think it's outdated. We think it is just advice, right? Whenever a church splits these three, functions, these primary functions, we are no longer irresistible. That doesn't make you stop being a church, except the part when you lose worship, but without the combination of all three things, loving God, building community, and serving the city, a church community is not irresistible. And that is why when you see the mission statement of our church here at Cross Point, we put all three things as an emphasis, right? We exist to make disciples of Jesus Christ by bringing our neighbors in to worship God, to build community, and to serve the city with us. That means the things that we are doing in this church is all about those three things. And as we do them well, we invite our friends to come to check out this irresistible community. And I believe as we do that, just like the early church, the Lord will add to their number day by day. A lot of people are going to come to faith as a result when you guys are passionate for our mission. Now, speaking of a irresistible community, I want to end this morning by talking about our church. Not to present ourselves as this shiny examples of irresistible community, but to showcase the goodness and the faithfulness that God has been doing among us for 30 years now, right? Next Sunday, we are going to celebrate our 30th anniversary. You guys remember this picture? Were you guys here for that? Yeah, some of you are not when you're on vacation, unfortunately. This is going on the wall very soon, right? We take one of these uh, church photos once every five years. It's going, and this one is the latest one. It's going on, 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 the, on the wall. I want to just do a quick poll among our church to see how long we have been here. So if you have been here for more than 10 years, can you raise your hand? That means you were here before 2013. Okay. If you grew up in this church, kids, if you're born into this church, then you've been here for 10 years. Okay. Keep your hand up for 15 years. Keep your hand up for 15 years. Okay. Keep your hand up for 20. John Ho? Okay. Okay. Uh, keep your hand up for 25. Wow. Okay. So three people. And then I know Wendy is our founding member. Wendy's been here since day one, all 30 years. Isn't it amazing how God just raised up generations after generations of Christians in this community for the kingdom of God? I mean, like for Wendy's family, four generations are here worshiping in our church. 
And uh, if Isaiah hurry up, then maybe there'll be a fifth generation. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> like, when I look around our church, there are all these different ways where I think we really look like the early church community from the book of Acts we're studying today. That doesn't mean we're perfect. We are far from it. And there's always, there's lots of things that we can get better, we can improve on. But over the last 10 years that I've been here personally, I really do feel like CACT has been an irresistible community to me and my family. 10 years ago, I came to this church as this young adult who um, just finished university and who recently gave his life to Christ. And I grew up here with everyone. And by God's grace, today, 10 years later, I get to serve the wonderful English congregation, you know, along with all of you guys. The Lord has given me so much through this church to the point that I feel like I came here too late. I really wish I was here earlier. I really wish I could grow up in a place like this. Because by all accounts, I had a pretty decent childhood. But God was missing. I never got to attend a church like this growing up. I never had this many loving adults who were pouring their life into me, investing their time in me, the way that our kids' ministry teacher and our youth counselors are pouring their life into the young people of our church. I have never belonged growing up to a community that cares so much about loving the neighborhoods around them, loving the people around them, caring about the well-being of other people and not just the accomplishments for themselves. Now, I know sometimes, I've heard many times when uh, those of you who grew up in this church may look at my story and be like, Ronnie, like, you didn't come from a church background, you have such a dramatic story of conversion, and that is so good, man, I wish I had that. But guys, the truth is, I'm the one who is envious of you guys, because if I can pick, I will pick your life. I would rather grow up in a church like this and, uh, and uh, experience God some other ways. The Lord has been so good to us, to our church, over the last 30 years. And for me, I want to raise my children here and keep building this church so they can become even more irresistible. And it is my hope that all of you will join us in this pursuit and that all of you guys are going to be part of our future for the decades to come.